Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. This is a Revelation Revolution. My name is Eric, and I am here with a fellow Rob Zombie fan, Michael Kester. Yeah, that is me. Always me. <laughs> An episode of uh, films we cover, so we won't have to talk about the Holy Mountain here on Double Feature. Uh huh. Which may be the first return to acid trip films since uh, Altered States. Yeah, which is weird because I have a I have a soft spot in my heart for acid trip films, Eric. Well, that's that's changed a lot since Altered States. I'm yeah. really excited to get into that. <laughs> uh, but we can't talk about that yet. No. Because this is, a, this is a pretty fucked up moment for us. This is a terrifying moment. Let's talk about Kickstarter for maybe the last time ever. All you right. may be hearing the sound of my voice for the last time ever. I don't really know. Yeah. This is actually the last time to go to kickstarter.doublefutureshow.com. Right. We, um, I, I mean, I feel like if I'm ever just going to put it out there, I have to do it now. Mm -hmm. If we don't fund this, we have to stop recording. Yeah. That's what happens. That's basically it. Right. I mean, I, I, I wish I could, I'm going to come on here and I'm going to try and be optimistic today, sure. but I'm also going to be honest. Right. I'm terrified and me too. And an emotional time bomb, which will make today's show very exciting. Absolutely. And, and the thing that's also particularly weird and, and creepy about the moments we're, we're recording right now uh -huh. is that we don't know if the kickstarter has been funded yeah yeah isn't that crazy we're, we're recording this a little bit ahead of time and so it's possible that we're sitting here terrified you're listening to the voices of two terrified podcast hosts who in the real world in real time are happily and relaxedly sitting there ecstatic that double feature gets to come back for another year I'm glad you can be the glass half full because uh, I, I think about a potential future uh, where there is no actual future and it, <laughs> it mortifies me. Uh, pause this recording and go see how we're doing. We don't even know in the time we're recording. I was, I'll, I'll cop to it. I thought I would be too emotional to record in the actual uh, last moments of our Kickstarter. Yeah. I imagine what I'm actually doing right now is sitting somewhere clicking refresh uh, sobbing quietly. That's what you do uh, to myself, loudly to myself. My neighbors are filing complaints. That's what you do with Kickstarter. Uh, anyways, <laughs> that is what you do. You warned me what what I was in for, but we have a chance to keep doing the show. I want to fucking do it. If you have, uh, if you're listening to this right now, which you clearly are, pause the recording. Go see how we're doing. Kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com, and I'm gonna do you. Uh, I'm gonna do you one even bolder than uh, the things that are coming out of my mouth right now. Uh, if you've already pledged, maybe think about pledging more. Is that, is that too bold? Is that... No, I mean, if, if that's the thing, is if at this point, that's, that's sometimes what has to... That's, that's our only option, right? Like, I don't know what else to say. That's what you do. That's what Kickstarter's about, is you give, you give, what, you, know, you, give what you can, and then you realize how much... <laughs> and then you give some you don't have. Yeah, that's what I Great. do. We're not even allowed to give to our own Kickstarter. No, nope. that's that's, that's what rules. we would usually do when this happens. When we ask for a donation to do a project, and then not enough people donate, and we just pay for the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, we were well, we were tapped beyond that point before we started this Kickstarter. But uh, if you want the show to stick around, it's Kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. We're really, really thankful for everybody who's pledged. Absolutely. Tell your friends. Go on the internet. Or raise some pledges. Think about uh, think about a future where you could get those wonderful incentives. Oh my God, I made it through that. All right, the cell <laughs> is. Uh, I want to play a game with the cell, if that's all right with you. Okay, I'm going to do that in my best saw voice. Okay, uh, or rather not. I want to play the game called "Who's a Tarsum Sing Actor and Who's a New Line Cinema Actor." Okay, and uh, let's start with Jennifer Lopez. Um, you know that's. Actually, that's a little harder than than you might. I would have, initially my initial thought is New Line Cinema, but uh, I know Tarsem Singh is a visual director, and Jennifer Lopez doesn't bring a whole lot to the table outside of looking like Jennifer Lopez. That's a good rationale. That's I was just going to clearly chalk that into New Line Cinema. 
Uh, where do you put Vince Vaughn? Vince Vaughn is New Line Cinema. <laughs> Vince Vaughn is one of the hardest things to look at in in film ever. What about Dean Norris of Breaking Bad fame? Uh, Tarsum Singh. And Patrick uh, Beauchot from Carnival? Definitely Tarsum Singh. <laughs> what about Dylan Baker of uh, such films as Trick or Treat, Requiem for a Dream, and Happiness? Uh, I'm so glad you picked all three of those. Um, <laughs> Dylan Baker, I would go Tarsum Singh. I don't even care. I love Dylan Baker. I was so happy to just see him pop up. Dylan Baker is great. Uh, this is, man, I don't know if this says something about us or about the uh, the careers of uh, of these people and this director, but there was a time when I saw this movie and I used to watch The Cell and think, wow, this is weird for a for a J-Lo and a Vince right? Vaughn film. Sure. And now I watch The Cell and think, wow, these are strange actors for a Tarsum Singh movie. Yeah. yeah. Times have changed in, in the years of our advent into the film world. Uh, I remember watching The Cell um, early on in my, in my goth years. <laughs> Sitting there I didn't know going... I these goth years. Oh, Tell me bullshit. about this. You, of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I seem remember... to remember you and Red Eyeliner at some point. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Sorry, um, this might, I, uh, it might be my last chance to give you jabs on the air. I just, <laughs> I, uh, I remember watching it in my goth face, going, "Oh man, this is such a dark movie." Oh, look at, oh, that cow is cut into so many pieces, like my soul. <laughs> um, I think it's a horse, not a cow. But go on. And and now you're I watch it. You're clearly a vegetarian, and you're goth ears as well. <laughs> Sorry. Now I watch it, and and I think. Uh, this is a cool movie. I don't, you know, like it initially yeah. the cell, I think everybody has two moments with the cell and it, the first time you see the cell, it's whatever, you know, I thought it was such a dark and twisted movie. And now I've gone so far beyond that. And what I know in cinema that I watch the cell and go, Oh, this is a, this is a good time. Yeah. I, Look at this. Well, I watch it and think, wow, this is a beautiful movie. Right. These are really gorgeous uh, set pieces. There's a lot right. of great art happening. It looks there. really good, but I mean, I no longer watch it and go, "Ooh, man, this is this is dark and fucked up. This is like Seven on steroids." Well, I'm glad you mentioned Seven. That's been coming up on our show a lot lately, and uh, Silence of the Lambs, and mm -hmm. you know these these kinds of movies. And I really just finally wanted to get into one. I think that there's certainly those visual elements of the cell, and then there's also the I mean, when they're in a fucking helicopter flying to the desolate field in the final act, you you kind of forget that you're not just watching Seven, right? Oh yeah. But we see um we see uh, another uh, killer, not entirely unlike we were just talking about. I fucking told you with those doll heads, yeah. That that was <laughs> that that was a thing, and then I struggled uh, in my mind to think where where are we seeing killers obsessed with dolls and mannequins and stuff. Sure enough, that's what Double Feature will do to you. The killer, I love in this movie, using the uh, ah, the old uh, parking garage late at night when you accidentally run over an albino dog trick. Yeah. Rather clever. <laughs> but I mean, I'll admit to it too. You know, this is, it, it has these kind of Marilyn Manson visuals. Yeah. Uh, sure. It's honestly why I saw it when it came out. It was yeah. 13 fucking years ago and I was into mechanical animals and Trent Reznor was doing a bunch of stuff with Marilyn Manson. Right. And this shared a, a look and a feel with, you know, Antichrist superstar music videos yeah. that at the time I couldn't put my finger on. Right. So it's exciting to watch it now and sort of know why that's happening. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think that that kind of plays into the way I saw it too, is I saw it in my dark gothy phase. Um, and yeah, you know, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it having drawn from Marilyn Manson and, and having these, these really dark overtones, but in the same way that maybe the matrix has the dark overtones. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I could see that. But what's fascinating about it is, is you and I sit there and we, we caught it on the surface level of, yeah, this is dark. And now you go back and you watch it again and you go, oh, this is all based on stuff. Yeah, sure. And that stuff that I thought was like this was based on that stuff. And instead <laughs> right. of going, Marilyn Manson is dark and so dark things look like this and the cell. Right. You have to backtrack another 50 years to find sure. the beginnings of your gothic roots. Sure. You see the, uh, I guess, the common inspiration uh, right. for those things. It becomes uh, 
also one of those oddities where, you know, people cover Tears for Fears Mad World, and then people cover the cover of Tears right. for Fears Mad World, and now we don't even know who did the original fucking Mad World. You'll find out that Mad World was actually a, a hymn from the 1900s. <laughs> right. Well, you hear the Tears for Fears version, you go, holy crap, somebody put a beat behind Mad World. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, you get kind of lost in that. I mean, it's good news, though. It means uh, you don't necessarily get lost over time. Sometimes you can find a lot of those common roots. So before we get too lost in the visuals, we both watched the uh, regular cut of this film. Which is very unlike Double Feature. It is, but the director's cut is kind of fucking hard to find. Yeah, it's really hard. I was looking for it because I had read that there was a direct... Whenever we do films, I go on the Wikipedia and <laughs> sure. I look at how long is they are. Is there a director's cut? <laughs> yeah, no, that's actually what you do is write down how much time it's, it is. I go on Wikipedia and I go, how long is the cell? And I go... One, I go, you know, oh, sweet, 94 minutes. Oh, my God, really? There's a 110-minute version? Yep. Ugh, I have to find a 110-minute version of The Cell? Sure, right. But then you can't find it, and then you have this bittersweet moment of, well, it's it's shorter, but it's not the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, th I can give you right now, this is one of the most disappointing when you find out what the director's cut is and realize you haven't seen it. It's one of the most disappointing moments. Yeah. The difference between the director's cut and the regular cut is that the regular cut basically takes out all the masturbation. Yeah. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking there's masturbation in the cell. Well, you wouldn't know that if you've seen the regular cut. <laughs> the, um, it, it's probably most interesting during the suspension scenes. Right. So there's this killer, and in the regular one, you just see him randomly suspend himself in the air and then start shaking uncontrollably <laughs> right well what you don't know is he's i mean uh you know a foot below him is this corpse and he is masturbating feverishly onto it right but what's what's so bizarre about taking that out of the film is that it makes more sense that way you think so are you kidding me to know that he's 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 suspending over this and, and sexually fetishizing these women to cut it out that dry it explains so much more of uh, sometimes he likes to bleach women after he's drowned them <laughs> and then hang over them. And then he's like, cool, and throws them in a dumpster. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. I thought, I thought, <laughs> right, no, I thought you meant the opposite. Oh, no, no, I was no. like, yeah, the masturbation is clearly a missing component. Sure. Here. There's a, there's a step question mark mm -hmm. in here somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you're going, well, wait a second. Why does he just, he starts shaking and then throws them out? That's kind of an odd thing right oh oh masturbation does make sense here which is the first time that you know suspending yourself by piercings and masturbating onto a corpse has helped <laughs> give some sense some semblance to what's going on so jennifer lopez uh, character enters his head and that's when the hour-long marilyn manson uh video begins right Tarsum Singh has done a couple other movies we actually sort of considered putting on right uh, with Valhalla Rising but uh, the pair was just too obvious or obnoxious. Right. Or the cell just wound up here. Yeah. He did The Fall and Immortals. Right. And I think he did Second Unit on Benjamin Button as well. I saw, I've seen, I've seen one of those. Time to get back to that queue, man. I know. That's on there. <laughs> Immortals is on my Netflix queue. Yeah, I haven't seen that either. Well, that's exciting. We get to go watch more Tarsum Singh movies. I think it's, uh, it's probably oversimplifying his work by saying he makes music videos. But, um, you know, you see the aesthetics here and how much he doesn't feel the need to justify that. Once he gets inside someone's head, he says, OK, I'm safe. That's it. Sure. I made my excuse. I'm going to show you what I really came here to do. Right. And that's the same um, with the fall. You know, we find an excuse to tell a story and then we get to, to play with what could almost, you know, be looked at as a. Uh, fashion modeling yeah, you know right it's in that world of uh, photography and of set design and of costumes i guess w when we start inside his mind that that none of that is you know what you're thinking of it's when we get to the catholicism and you know the virgin mary kind of ideas that's when i start thinking about all of that right but we start on i mean uh a dog shaking all the blood off of it. And immediately after that, it seems fairly tame. We get to that scene of the horse. 
Yeah. So, God, this fucking horse scene will forever be one of the most lasting cinematic images I have in my head. I've remembered it since the very first time I saw this, right when it came out. And every subsequent watching, I know the scene is coming. Yeah. And I think about it, when we're watching Final Destination, all I could think of was that fucking horse scene. (laughs) There's a ticking clock that I forget about, and it abruptly stops, and I never remember it counting backwards either. But to that, the little boy pushes her out of the way, and it perfectly severs and displays this piece. In much the way the film is severing out uh, chunks of it and displaying the music video-esque sections of it. The other thing I forget that just, man, and these things I forget make the scene so much better when you're watching it, but it's how she kind of walks by it and it's still alive. It's yep. still moving and the parts are beating. And uh, um, that first sequence has a lot of good stuff. It has the huge Mortal Kombat esque bodybuilder. Yeah, that's terrifying. Which is pretty fucked up. It has um, the uncoupling of the sort of pink purple ribbons. As he's walking down the stone staircase. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. And it's just, it's haunting. And he he very much sits at a throne of his mind. You immediately know, okay, this is the guy we're here for. This is his domain. Mm-hmm. Coming down from those steps and just that low growling, what are you here for? Yeah. Uh, and she panics and she leaves. Ah, oh, man, it's great. Well, we come back to the real world and there's also this kind of link between um you know we're seeing these things in his mind and then sort of figuring out how does that play into the silence of the lambs esque right manhunt you know serial killer save the hostage thing and i think a lot about the suspension and in my copy the absence of masturbation <laughs> as being a reoccurring theme you know i think it's weird we have the suspension not only in uh what he's doing but also they're kind of suspended in the bodysuits when they're entering yeah. people's minds. Right. We see that theme throughout the movie, and it's one of those things... I mean, did you get the Altered States feeling at all when you were watching this? If you remember back to Altered States, it was a lot of that, uh, that chamber, and you're suspended in the chamber, and that kind of allowed you to transfer into whatever the fuck was happening in that movie. I guess, yeah, the chamber is definitely... The chamber always makes me think of Fringe. Yeah, that's true too, but you know that but, that yeah, is of course right. because of altered states. I think yeah. And you should remember that if only because of naked right. uh, Nina Sharp. Of course. Um How dare you forget? It's weird because I think the difference between something like Altered States and Valhalla Rising, which we'll get to, is the cell is so much more about this uh controlled surrealism. Yeah. A lot of the bases for a lot of the individual scenes uh are actual surrealistic paintings and so i don't get and again this this comes from a place of complete naivety because neither you nor i have ever taken acid so i don't know if you drop acid and suddenly you can completely control all these fantastic scenes of understanding or if it's more like an unblossoming you know flower that you can't see the middle of until you get there you know every time you say something like this people write in and try and explain to us what it's like to be on acid yeah that's when we get the most emails (laughs) ever well here they come then we should have put do lsd as one of our kickstarter incentives (laughs) right (laughs) it's that theme and then the water too kind of reminds me of that suspension chamber i mean the water being a theme in here with baptism and uh the trapped women i guess are being yeah. you know, drowned in these water tanks but we talked a lot on altered states about water suspension and all of that uh all of that good real world influence in the let's call them dubious lsd experiments right one of the other things in identification when i'm going okay, now I understand all these uh, Manson-esque tools that are at use here, is the time shifting. And I always love to call this out when we see it in movies because it's such a gimmicky mechanic and I can't get enough of it. I just eat it up. Anytime uh, you're watching a movie and a scene will speed up unexpectedly in some sort of attempt to 
throw you off. Uh, not so much in the Zack Snyder sense we've talked about of using kind of a faster motion and then dipping back into slow motion. Right. But you'll see this a lot in horror. Um, well, you don't really see it a lot anywhere, but when you do see it, I think it's most often in horror. Mm -hmm. This movie will speed up unexpectedly for simple things, like to pan from one location to another location. Sure. Areas where it just it throws off your internal sense of timing, of rhythm. Mm -hmm. And I think expecting that natural kind of rhythm, it's one of the things that lends itself to being off-putting. It doesn't in itself necessarily scare you. It just tells you this is an unpredictable environment. Right. Uh, there's nothing on the screen for you to be afraid of right now. But just to let you know, we could shift time at any point. Right. It really puts you on edge. <laughs> sure. When you can't trust simple givens like the movement over time. Right. It doesn't bode well. Sure. For your sense of, of safety. Mm -hmm. Another thing is the long neck perfect drug birds and the the water damage sets the yeah. walls the patterns the colors just the general decayed nature that i think a lot of these movies in that a lot of the draw to something like seven when we just mentioned it the other week we had talked about people think back to it for how disturbed and grungy it is sure and as movies will play with that more and more and allude to something like seven in the work that's come before it no one really just wanted to dive right into the killer's head yeah and i don't think that's done as well uh up to the points until the cell came along right it literally went well everybody wants to get into that stuff well, why don't we just take you right inside the killer's sure. mind right and then you get in there and suddenly you're confronted with all this stuff that doesn't make any goddamn sense and you extrapolate backwards and finally realize oh i know why Everything in this guy's head is fucking hard to understand because killers are insane. <laughs> right. Well, because he hasn't been stabbed yet. You right. See, if you yeah. stab him, all the problems go away. Yeah. That's what we learned today on Double Feature. Violence makes all the problems go away. <laughs> I couldn't have really given you a much better transition yeah. to Valhalla Rising. Give me the one name I'm going to know before, uh, before I just descend slowly into <laughs> madness. Before uh, before I give you the one name you're going to know, it's probably the one name you're going to know on paper because I don't know if I know how to pronounce it. Um. I will do you the favor of Nicholas Winding Refn. Thank you. <laughs> you're very welcome. I never know if it's winding. Oh, God, I have no idea. I just, I'm, I, I think I'm. I have no uh, idea. I have no problem taking the heat for okay. this pronunciation of names. <laughs> uh, Nicholas did Drive, which is also known as a film personally crafted for the hosts of Double Feature. That's correct, which is. Thanks, Nick. Really appreciate that. Actually, a fantastic achievement considering his previous. Uh, attempt at derailing double feature in its entirety uh by having us do bronson oh yeah that was <laughs> right that was right uh which was also spectacular it's great horrifying yeah. for us we it was were just horrifying that was one of the early moments in double feature history where we watched a film and sat there and went can we talk, talk about, about this, this? <laughs> wait what do we do <laughs> People on the internet are going to hear us discuss this. <laughs> oh, no. Um, that and, was a pretty horrifying moment. And we all thought we were safe, and then we saw Valhalla rising. Yeah. Uh, I refuse to put this on the show for, I want to say a long time, but I guess it's only been since we did Drive. Right. But you've been, you know, every time we talk about pairing movies up, this comes up, and I just, I'm too scared. Yeah. I just have no idea what happens. And also the movie scares me a little bit. It's a, so that's not it's helping. It's perfect in that way. It's, I think Valhalla Rising as a film is one of the scariest movies that's not a horror film. The film itself seems entirely unhinged. You're thrown into a situation that historically has very, very, very deep basis. But you're not sure where in the story you are. Yeah. They kind of go... So there were heathens, and then the Christians came. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of sounds like last week for me, right. so I don't know. <laughs> it's just, it, the film kind of, it gives you the opening titles where it explains that it's about Christianity coming to, you know, the, the moors of South Scotland or whatever. Right. right. And then there are people fighting, <laughs> and you go, are these Christians? Are these Christians fighting the heathens? Are these heathens fighting heathens? That guy has one eye. Right. Oh, good. You're never going to explain anything. 
Well, I'm going to try a new trick in my ongoing quest for accessibility. Sure. I'm going to call this the lazy phone a friend. Uh, I, I just want to cheat off your paper. Please explain <laughs> Valhalla Rising to me. So basically, in a nutshell, the uh, story, the plot of Valhalla Rising, which is probably secondary, if not tertiary, <laughs> is that there's this guy who eventually is named One-Eye, and he's a fierce fighter, but he's also basically a killer. He's a monster of a human being. He follows you until it behooves him to slit your throat and walk in the other direction. So as a heathen, he is still feared and hated by heathens. So they entrap him and have him fight them because that's sport. That's their enjoyment. And they like seeing if their warriors are strong enough and whatever, whatever. Now, heathen doesn't have the same context as perhaps our day to day lives here. Right. Because heathen, in my mind, means, uh, you know, atheist or woman who will sleep with me. Right. But uh, heathen in this context probably just means. Well, honestly, probably just means not part of the Crusades. Yeah, it's it's non it's a non Christian polytheistic person. Sure. And so in this sort of mythology, you could literally be from hell right. and also be a heathen. Correct. Great. So this film unfolds. We have this character who uh never speaks, and so we never get inside his head unless we're inside his head the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so the one thing that becomes the crux of one eye as a character is when the chieftain is describing why he never loses. And he says, um, he never loses because he, what fights lives on hate or feeds on hate or fights because yeah, of hate. Sure. And, uh, so we get that kind of brief glimpse into the character of one eye and then we get nothing until the very end of the film. Did you just say glimpse into the character of one eye? That's the thing you just said. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and so while we're kind of unpacking who is clearly a very complex character, the film is not pretending that this guy just fights and haha, that's badass. Yeah. He runs afoul of some Christians and they take him on as a warrior in a conquest to retake Jerusalem for the Christians. So that's another interesting turn in the film for me because you get these Christians who you're kind of told and you never see anything of heathens other than wanton bloody battle. Uh -huh. So it's easy to go. These guys are a little bit nuts. Let's get away from them. And then you have these Christians and they speak to each other and they're wearing clothes and <laughs> right. they have an agenda. And so it's easy for me as a viewer to take that and go, okay, these guys know what they're doing. Let's at least put this lost character on a path. Yeah, right. So that's what ostensibly the film does is it sticks. Them I love that the group of Christians, by the way, are a novelty for you. Yeah. <laughs> Not to make this suddenly a show about atheism, <laughs> but you talk about them like when we were talking about Troll Hunter. Yeah. And then they came along some trolls. <laughs> and then, oh, look, they found some Christians. What interesting creatures. <laughs> um. Yeah, well, that's kind of what happens, and they they all they all hop on their god boat, and <laughs> wow, they set sail for Jerusalem. This moment in the film for me, when they're on the boat, I don't know if it happens for you, but I feel so sick. Yeah, the way it looks, absolutely, it's all foggy. Everybody's miserable. Yep. You hear the quiet lapping of water. You're, I'm sitting there just going, can you fucking paddle or something? Can we make this any Talk to each other. faster? Not just starve on a boat and get arrowed. Right. Well, that's the worst as soon as the arrow comes. Yeah. It's just, oh, there's no hope. <laughs> Everyone just please kill yourself now. Well, and that's, that's, that's the thing that happens, right, is you get the arrow. You get – what's interesting to me as a resident of the United States of America is to see how much Jerusalem looks like – the American East Coast. <laughs> they they finally come to what is supposed to be Jerusalem, and you discover that whoops, they found America. And immediately following that, we find out that the leader of the Christians is a crazy person. Sure. And he misled all these people to come to wherever he thought he was going, and now he's gonna start New Jerusalem and everything's gonna be great. In the meantime, Everybody is, it's a group of men, all men, 
who have discovered a completely uncharted nation. Sure. And he's sitting there going, when they bring women, I will start new Jerusalem. Nobody knows where the fuck they are. <laughs> right. This is, <laughs> right. and it's set, that's when the, uh, the chapter marker hell comes across, right? Yeah. When they find America and it looks beautiful because it's, you know, Nicholas Reffin's work. It looks gorgeous. And you're sitting there going, drink the water, eat the fruit. Everything is fine. Right. You're going to live out your days as, as fat, haughty gentlemen. But instead, they all drink from the acid jug. <laughs> sure. It's, it's this moment of solidarity in the film where the whole team of men kind of drink this water and go on an acid trip. And everybody kind of does different things. And some of it's a lot weirder than others. But I think what's happening there is we get this bizarre look into each character. But also what we understand is there's a certain reality to a film that has people do drugs. And I know this is kind of heady to talk about, but if you think about, if you think about, did, did, have you seen the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus? I haven't, no. Alice in Wonderland, better example. Yeah, I'm not allowed to see Terry Gilliam movies sure. <laughs> uh, because of our show. We've been banned. Alice in Wonderland, if Alice in the middle of Wonderland started you know, dropping acid and going on a real acid trip. I'm pretty sure that's what happens else <laughs> in Wonderland. Suddenly Wonderland becomes a realer place because you can trip in Wonderland. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Right. And so to give all these people. So seeing these men take acid. Right. Suddenly it goes. It grounds the film in yeah, a strange way. It suddenly goes, okay, we've been talking a lot about going to hell and these, this man being a demon and all this stuff. But no, this well, is. Visions. Right. Yeah. This is the real world. And in the real world, you can go on an acid trip and you can have all this shit. Sure. But when they come out of it, they're in America before it's America and they're fucked. <laughs> right. So before we get to the ending of this movie, I want to tell you the tiny bits that I know from what Refn has said about the ending. Mm -hmm. Also, I didn't uh, mention you were talking about the look of the film. And I thought that's a really interesting thing, too. We haven't seen this a lot on the movie, but mm -hmm. on the uh, show. Yeah. But this is a movie that uses a lot of color burns. Yeah. It uses a lot of um, uh, the characters appear to kind of glow or emit light. Mm -hmm. It looks like a lot of the movie was probably filmed during the daytime and then darkened sure. later. It's a little bit different technique than Day for Night, which we talked about on 28 Weeks Later. Mm -hmm. But uh, an interesting technique all the same just makes the movie look completely different than when you shot it. Sure. Also, a lot of the backgrounds are really lit where the characters are not. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that throws you off, too, is seeing everything in silhouettes or, yeah. uh, you know, with very few high whites. Right. It makes everything kind of feel otherworldly. Uh, brings that sort of darkness to it. It's a very damned, very bleak yeah. uh, look for the movie, which is also upsetting while I'm trying to understand it. Well, and that's a weird, it's a weird way to look at a film about a group of men who discover a country. They discover an entire <laughs> sure. world. Sure. And instead of everybody's idea of Columbus discovers the new world and aha, America was born. Turns out, how many other people discovered the new world? Yeah, right. How many other people got shipwrecked going somewhere else and died on the coasts of America? Well, so when you say discovered another world, I'm starting to think, oh, we're really, we're bringing an idea together toward the end of the film. Things are starting to make sense. And then uh, remembering the actual end of the film, which I want to talk to you about a little bit. <laughs> But all I knew coming into Valhalla Rising after the first time I saw it and tried to make sense of it is that uh, the original ending had a spaceship in it. Yeah. Which you is, told me that. In talking about the plot, the, you know, the director is always comparing it to an acid trip. Uh, he says he has no knowledge or even interest in Vikings and that that was kind of a means to an end. So much so that he actually had someone else write the mm -hmm. Norse mythology portion of the film. Sure. And he wrote the acid uh, portion and then wanted a UFO at the end of the movie. And you told me this, but I totally agree. You said that he thought a UFO would make the film too easy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, right. And I, I mean, I kind of see where he's coming from. I totally agree. Because what the film is kind of going for the entire time is this idea that 
the world has existed. I mean, that everything has existed so much longer than we give it credit for. Oh, that's definitely something you could take away from it. I didn't even think of that. And especially to compare it. And so that's, that's what I, that's what's so interesting about it is, is you're taking this heathenism, right? This polytheistic religion who believes in all these different gods and whatever, and you're singularizing it into Christianity. Christianity is gobbling up all these different unknown truths and made up sure. bullshit. But what's another thing that you and I specifically dislike about Christianity? I don't know what you're talking about. It eliminates history. Sure. Dinosaurs are fossils that God put here to test our faith. Well, and let's not even approach the subject of the uh, historical Jesus. Right. When we talked <laughs> on uh, the God who wasn't there, I think that yeah. was called. The whole film kind of goes, Christianity is coming to gobble up these these natural truths. Right. Something like, there is more world than we understand. Or UFOs. You know, the kind of thing where we're sitting here in, in 2013 going... Yeah, a spaceship, that'll probably look kind of like an airplane, but it'll be round. <laughs> right. But what we never think is that's what it would look like back in 10,000 BC as well. Sure. Because sure. UFOs could be a thing that have been around that long. You know what? Right. I, I feel like I'm rambling and I think- Well, you do border of, into uh, conspiracy right. territory and for I, a second, but, and I'm, but hold on. Let me, let me stop you there before we get any deeper into this, because I think I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So in a universe where, uh, let's take for a moment that perhaps aliens have visited Earth. Sure. Which I don't believe is a hypothesis you're behind. Am no. I wrong? Yeah, I, I don't believe that. Okay, so aliens probably haven't visited Earth. Right. But you're saying our concept we have right now, the popular concept of what if they had visited Earth? Wouldn't that be weird? Mm -hmm. We envision the way that looks, again— Probably not something that has happened. Right. But we envision the way it looks, shiny metal saucer, here and now in today's modern society. And then we try and think about shiny metal saucer back during the Crusades yeah. because aliens with their far advanced hypothetical technology would still be far advanced back then. Right. And it seems insane, right. more so insane than right sure. now. And, and Yeah, I absolutely follow you. And then the whole idea is that Christianity is trying to quash this knowledge of of a planet that existed before Christianity. Right. And then after all of that kind of happens and we get the Christian characters, uh, we get the weird um, bit, uh, the thing about the singularity of the Trinity where the son goes back to be with his father who is probably already dead. And there's that whole weird thing where the Trinity is now, you know, been born in the United States before they're the United States. Mm-hmm. We finally get this moment that ends the film in a way that you and I would almost classify as a fuck you ending. We get one eye and the child who are kind of standing. They discover the ocean. They know which direction is home. And they turn around and they discover that this new world already has inhabitants. And that new world is just as against being made Christian as the heathens were against the Christians. Sure. Uh, that new sure. world is against accepting the heathens who are, you know, not Christian, but it's just this thing about resistant to change based on the planet you live on. Sure. The world you're a part of. Right. And we've seen one eye slaughter everyone this whole time mm -hmm. and in in no universe do i think that he couldn't turn around start flailing wildly and take out a whole bunch of sure you know uh american indians yeah but he's now the adoptive father of this young boy he's the only thing that boy has he you know he wants that boy to live well and suddenly he doesn't live on hate anymore right he's unable to fight the way he knows how to fight so he knows the only way for that boy's well-being to be preserved is to walk up to there let them beat the shit out of him and they will realize oh these people aren't a threat yeah sure and let the little kid live and then you know probably die <laughs> right <laughs> What do you make then of the sort of vision of being beaten to death, but then also of walking away into the water? We get 
this thing that gets kind of brought up throughout the course of the film where people keep asking one eye what he sees and what he saw and his visions and that whole idea. Mm -hmm. And I think that the basic thing there is that we're supposed to be seeing a character who is, you know, obviously of limited vision. Uh And that's something that's compounded by the fact that he's never had a path. He's never been on a road. Sure. Because we never see these end game visions until he's set in on the course to America. Right. I don't really have a direct answer for why he sees the vivid image of him dying, but I do think he knows that the path he's taking is the one that's going to lead to his end. And we get the title, which is Valhalla Rising. And I don't know if you're familiar with the of course not. mythos of Valhalla is is basically Viking heaven, uh-huh. but you don't go there unless you die in battle. Sure. Well, and then also the title of sacrifice. Right. I do think it's interesting, though, now that you, you kind of pointed out that he sees these visions the entire time and uh, sort of winds up in these places. And then in the end moment, we get what you might consider a vision if it weren't for the fact that it was plain as day. Right. It doesn't use the same visual techniques sure. as the rest of the movie. Sure. And that is the one that perhaps is betrayed. Sure. You know, this could be something, a, a kind of inevitability he's seeing in a certain sense and chooses to make the sacrifice right. himself rather than letting it play out the way it does. Right. Well, and also the idea then of death not in battle, you know, not going to Valhalla is that your soul is trapped where you die. Sure. And so to get him walking into the river there is to kind of go, well, America, you may not know the story of one eye discovering your country, but he lives, <laughs> he lives in the veins of America to, to maybe even say that the, that the first martyr in America was a nonviolent one. I think that's blasphemy. Uh, <laughs> to say nothing, actually, of your exercise in religious relativism practiced and in the interpretation of Valhalla Rising. Oh, well, thank you. Um, we have a Kickstarter, kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. And uh, I, we made it through that whole show, and I didn't cry once that didn't get edited right i was just gonna the, say you edited the tears <laughs> out out of the recording uh i'm glad we got through the show honestly i didn't you know i didn't know how this was gonna go and we actually put together an okay show despite my uh emotional turmoil oh my god so heavy <laughs> we um we still have a kickstarter go there right now uh honestly we just fucking love talking to you guys and we don't want to stop doing that um, given that the the future is really uncertain for the first time ever, we don't know what's going to be on the show next week. We don't know if the show is going to keep going. We just kickstarter dot That's that's all I got. Yeah. Um. So, uh, what? Watch more fucking film. <laughs>